Greetings, everybody. <laughs> My name is Andrea Boykowicz, and I'm the Assistant Director at Open Planning and Development Corporation. Uh, and this is our monthly Oak Watch slash Let's Talk meeting. Sometimes it's our Let's Talk slash Oak Watch meeting. This month, however, we are putting Oak Watch first, certainly. Uh, last week, month, we uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Let's Talk conversation, or fortunately, as it happens, it was a very lively conversation. Uh, let's talk uh, subsumed the Oak Watch spot. And therefore, in order to make sure that we have time enough to be able to go through the many things on the agenda that are of keen interest, uh, we are placing Oak Watch first. And I just wanted to uh, welcome uh, Councilman Kraus and the members of his office there. I'm seeing Bob and I saw Brocia's name earlier, but I'm losing things on the screen. Um, <clears throat> and I believe that um, uh, Director Dash will be joining us very shortly uh, to provide an update on the residential permit parking. Um, and I'm about to hand this over to Elena, but would like to say for the record um, that this meeting is not going to include any discussion of the Oakland crossings uh, issue. Uh, and if you have questions about that, or if you um, have th things that you'd like to be able to share, please email us at questions at opdc.org. Uh, and Sam, if I could ask you to please put that into the chat. Um, and please be aware that the development activities meeting, uh, and I will announce this again at the end of the meeting, the development activities meeting for the zoning legislation under consideration for that uh, design concept uh, will be on Monday the 29th, so the Monday after Thanksgiving uh, at 6 p.m. and everybody will get a notice. And again, if you have any questions or if you'd like to be able to provide comments, um, please email those to us. That would be the most helpful thing. Uh, and thank you very much to Councilman Kraus for coming. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Elena and take it away. Good evening. I'm Elena Zaitsov. I'm the chair of Oak Watch. I'm here tonight with Liz Gray, the quality control consultant for OPDC. And um, the Oak Watch mission statement, the Oakland Code Enforcement Project works to improve the quality of life in Oakland by bringing people and institutions together to identify code violations, advocate for their remediation, and monitor the outcomes. Tonight, we're pleased to have City Councilman Bruce Krause with us to update us on the rental registry legislation. Thank you for coming, Councilman. Hi, Elena. Hi. Um, so uh, it's a very short update. Uh, there is uh, not a whole lot to share rental registry via ordinance was submitted to city council. Again, it was preliminary, preliminarily passed and final approved last week. Today, we took under consideration, which is part of our budget process, the, uh, our fee um, structure. Uh, and our fee structure, along with all of the other uh, uh, budget bills, will not be final passed until December the 15th. So uh, nothing can happen in terms of enforcement or application of rental registry until the fee um, uh, structure is passed. Uh, so legislation submitted, approved, passed, the mayor has it. Uh, it is in place. Uh, the fee has been purposefully separated, put into the fee structure. So if adjustments need to be made, fees can be adjusted without having to uh, tamper with the legislation in any way, but that cannot be voted till December 15th. So I don't expect anything um, to be in place in terms of application or enforcement until the end of the year. Uh, and then number two, I was asked to update on what is very loosely called block parties, which are anything but block parties. Uh, Bob and I have uh, been in, in, in rather deep discussion about how best to approach that situation. Uh, we are working with law uh, to uh, understand if there are a way that we can sort of separate that kind of event away from what is normally uh, called a block party. I would like to see things like a requirement by the applicant to provide insurance policies. Uh, and uh, we could uh, come up with how to structure that and just how high of a, um, uh, a policy would be required. Uh, I would hope that something like that would 
discourage an applicant from applying if they had to purchase that kind of an insurance policy. And number two, to provide for uh, off-duty police officers. Uh, and they can be quite expensive. They can want, run well into the hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, and they are required via the number of participants that you have. Um, and if, uh, if someone is wishing to host something like what we saw uh, this past fall, uh, I would believe they could run into thousands of dollars in terms of uh, paying for off-duty police officers to actually be formal, former formal participants in the event. I apologize, I'm a little off today. I, uh, I'm not feeling real well and uh, I was actually out today. But, uh, but those are the updates that I was asked to make and uh, I'll be happy to take a couple questions if, uh, if that's helpful in any way. So block parties separate from community festivals? Well, the applicant uh, applied for a block party. Uh, and, you know, we have this choice between block parties and special events and how and why something like this is not considered a, a special event, event escapes me. But um, I, I really would like to structure something legislatively under the advice of law uh, that uh, we don't run into this again. Uh, there's, there are things I would love to share with you, but I'm under attorney client privilege. Uh, I, I can assure you that everybody everybody did everything in their power to keep that um, event from happening this year, uh, but uh, could not find a legal way to deny a permit based on previous applicants' permits. Uh, so, and that's sort of the catch-22 we're in, and that's what I'm working with in law to try to figure out how we can prevent that from happening again. Well, I guess it, it so it, will there be a legal distinction between, well, I, and I think you I were, don't, recall with our South Oakland community day, we had a problem when we were a special event, then it was like lots of uh, extra expenses and paperwork and they eventually they actually for a while denied us the permits. Yeah, I, I can't give you the specifics because okay. it's a moving target mark. Okay. But it's sort of, I'm trying to approach it from two different um, uh, ways. Uh, one, one of them, I, I would hope that the, the fee structure would be so enormous from insurance policies and off-duty officers that it would, uh, it would be a um, preemptive way to um, make it much less attractive to attempt to uh, make application for that kind of a permit because of the cost that would be associated with it. I recall that um, in the incident one of the issues was that the number of participants was not put on the permit. Um, perhaps there wasn't a place for it. So um, can we make sure that happens? I'll be happy to, to, uh, uh, to share that with law, yes. Well, I also felt that um, perhaps in restricting the permits the way you're talking about is is also punishing people who truly want to have a block party. Um, so perhaps there should be more emphasis on enforcement rather than having the people who actually want to have a block party um, pay these enormous fees and get insurance and things like that. Like if neighbors want to have a block party, uh, they shouldn't be penalized because someone else abused their permit. So no, perhaps no. enforcement could be a part of that legislation. So Kathy, we're talking the difference between uh, preemptive and reactive. And reactive is always much more difficult because the process is underway. We've got to go in and intervene. A, a regular block party that is a city block from intersection to intersection does not contain several thousand people. It just doesn't. Um, could you have 100 people? Probably you could. Should we look at numbers like that as a starting point? Probably we should. But again, it's all a moving target. I'm happy to take any kind of uh, suggestions that you, you might have. But the idea of once a permit is granted uh, and then uh, sending the cavalry in to, uh, uh, to enforce, I think you saw this past time that didn't work so well. 
well, I, I didn't see enforcement. So, um, I mean, there was obviously, if there's a limit to the number of people that are permitted, nobody was enforcing that. And if underage drinking is prohibited, that wasn't being enforced. So I, my concern is that people, neighborhoods who, who want to have legitimate neighborhood gatherings are going to be penalized by this. Mm -hmm. We'll do everything in our power to prevent that. I do not believe there was a number of participants listed on the application. Uh, so I don't know what would have been enforced there. And the underage drinking, it really falls under state liquor code. I mean, we, we, we have some traction with local law enforcement and social host ordinance that I, that I crafted, but the liquor laws really are, that, that's an LCB uh, function that uh, I, would, um, I would challenge, would fall under their purview to, to enforce um, underage consumption. Uh, social host would certainly deal with um, the applicant, I believe. I'd, I'd have to revisit the legislation, but it, it could make application toward the applicant's responsibility to, um, to know what is taking place on a social function they are hosting. Uh, and if there is underage sales or service, they would be held responsible. <coughs> See one hand raised from Liz here. Liz, is that on purpose? Yeah, no, actually it was. I would, because I'm thinking along the line of the underage drinking and that they're, you know, recently I've been having to read a lot about the LCB. And I think that that might be something that law wants to bring in. Also, in reality, quite honestly, who's going to insure a bunch of college kids for a block party? Nobody well, you're kind mind. of, you're, you're reading my mind, Liz. Yeah, nobody in the right mind is going to do that. At least mm -hmm. there's nobody responsible <laughs> would do it. But at least it's going in the right direction. I'm glad to hear that, I will say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there um, any other questions um, about the block parties? I, I just have one question about the rental registry. Was um, taking the money out of it and putting it in the separate fee structure, was that the only change? I, I believe nothing would have been changed. Nothing would have been adjusted. Just the fee was lowered and it's in our, it's put in our, uh, our fee. Um, uh, Bob, help me. What, why am I blanking on the, the, the word I'm looking fee, for? Fee structure. Yeah, it's, it, but it's not that. It's our, our um, the, uh, fee schedule. Fee schedule, thank you. Uh, and we passed that today preliminarily. Well, we, we, it's, it's been read into the record, but it won't be finalized for this. No. So uh, uh, once that's passed, then, then again, uh, uh, that, that's more of a legal question. I would believe would be able to begin to apply and enforce rental registry. I, I would believe, but I feel more comfortable if that came from someone in the administration. Councilman, the, the, Note from uh, Director Kenner said it's 180 days from when that passes. Okay, great. From the final vote of the budget, do you think, or from the December 15th vote of the budget? I guess when the fee structure is, is adopted. Okay, which could be with the signing of that legislation. So let's just, let's just to be safe, 180 days from January 1. Let's just mm -hmm. play it that way. And Councilman, I do have, I did remember the third thing you wanted to talk about. If uh, yeah, <laughs> it was what was license. it? Part, oh, the liquor license. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's been a uh, application for liquor license at. Help me with the address, Bob, please. Um, Six Myron, is that right? Two twenty six Myron, but it's not an application for a license, apparently. Well, there there is so much shenanigans and nonsense taking place with this license. Um, it somehow, we believe, Prasad is involved. Um, I called, oh. yeah, oh yeah. I thought I shared this with you, Liz. No. I, okay, so we believe that to be so. Um, but um, 
we we work with an attorney um, on some other issues, and um, anyway, on a on a sort of a whim, I thought I would call him and ask him if he thought the um, the placard had been posted properly. It looked like there was no attorney representing uh, the applicant. There had been a number of changes made with things that had been blacked out and dates rewritten and things like that. And at the very least, I thought we would be able to uh, get them on needing to repost for another 30 days. Uh, and uh, with that would at least buy some time to file a petition to intervene. But what I found out was uh, this attorney has already, he's representing the woman that actually holds that liquor license that they're trying to take from her. And he has already filed petition to intervene. So it is already in the legal process and that this attorney is, is representing. But uh, I, I, I don't want to talk out of turn. He told me some things that I'd really rather not share in a public arena, but it's, it's prasad. So, you know, you can only imagine the kind of uh, nonsense that's taking place. So that's the old Pittsburgh Cafe? Uh, I don't know, Mark. It's the, the house the, the, the house that was a bar, then they renovated it, and then it was right. a pit football player owned it. And... Yeah. It's been through a lot of hands. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's in really bad hands now. But it's good to know that the, that a very competent attorney is in, involved and has already filed a petition to intervene on the transfer of that license. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, okay. counsel. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And I hope you feel better. Yeah, thank you. I am going to sign off. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Next, we have Andrew Dash, Director of City Planning, to talk about the proposed ordinance which makes changes to the re Residential Parking Permit Program. Try saying that fast three times. Um, Director Dash, welcome to Oak Watch. Uh, why don't you start with a brief overview of the changes and then um, address some questions? Sure. Um, I right. will try to be brief. Um, so, you know, we are, the city is looking to, um, you know, do a complete revision of chapter 549 of the code, which, uh, you know, is the code relative to residential permit parking. Um, in advance of, you know, uh, you know, there has been kind of a series of public engagements that we've been doing uh, in advance of uh, the legislation moving to council. Um, through March and April, we did survey uh, residents <laughs> relative to uh, their preferences for the program. Uh, we had about 2,400 residents that responded uh, to that survey. Uh, we did two public meetings. Uh, we've had a post agenda and a public hearing uh, at city council. And then uh, we've, we've also been doing, you know, kind of one-off community meetings like this uh, as well. So overall, what we are trying to do is a couple things. Uh, first is clarifying the administrative process. So uh, presently, the Pittsburgh Parking Authority handles permitting and enforcement, and the Department of City Planning at the City of Pittsburgh handles changes to the districts. So if that's changes to grace period, if that's expansions, um, you know, new districts, uh, that's all work that the Department of City Planning is, do is doing presently. Um, you know, we will be uh, proposing that, you know, that that be moved. Uh, initially in the legislation, it was proposed to be moved to the Pittsburgh Parking Authority. Um, there has been a lot of conversations that have gone on uh, through the public engagement that we've had around the city still having control of that. And so, you know, we are city councils working relative to how that, you know, how that, you know, gets resolved. Uh, but um, ultimately, there has been a lot of discussions around the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, DOMI, uh, also, manage, you know, managing uh, the designation of residential permit parking areas as they do manage a number of other things that happen on the curb uh, and in the roadway. Uh, the second item is changing and updating the ways that residential permit parking areas can be created or changed. Uh, presently, it's all done by via petition process. So it is all right now, the only way that you can add, a add to a district, create a new district, uh, do any of those things is, uh, is through a petition process. And, you know, that resident-driven petition process obviously takes a lot of time, um, is a pretty onerous process. In addition to that, it's 
not necessarily, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily equitable in that, you know, it is places where, um, you know, communities that have the capacity to be able to, to have people doing petitions are the ones who tend to be able to go through this process. And so that petition process is still an option for communities that wish to do it. Um, however, what's being proposed is that, you know, the neighborhood plan that's being created for Oakland and it, you know, could be a way in which new residential permit parking er areas are identified. City council could be the one who initiates changes or new permit parking areas. Uh, the parking permit officer, the person doing, you know, doing this designation work can work with, uh, you know, to initiate the process. Once that process is initiated, obviously then we're going out and doing parking a study like we are now. We're going out and doing community process with registered community organizations and other, and, and, and other resident groups. Um, all of that will still occur as a part of this. It's just how you can start a process. Uh, we wanted to be able to create new options that may make it easier uh, and may make uh, the discussion for where we're creating new areas more policy-based and you know more around needs as opposed to solely where we have people that can you know that can do the petition process. Um, another item was around changing uh, some of the non-resident permits that we have. Uh, so presently, uh, right now, what we have is you know residents can get a permit. Uh, in addition to that, there is a visitor pass uh, that is available, and there are a lot of other things that are going on. Uh, you know, you know, parking and residential permit parking areas that happen by a variance to the parking authority. And what we want to do is limit the opportunity for those variances and create new permit types uh, so that, and so, you know, there are changes to the visitor pass as a part of that, further limitation of the visitor pass as it stands right now. Um, a visitor pass can be used three days in a row. As, and, and then as long as there's a day gap uh, between that, they can use three days additional and they can do that throughout the same month. Um, we did limit that to 12 days a month that those can be used, uh, trying to trying to under, you know, trying to both balance uh, the needs of, um, you know, of residents who have visitors that are frequent, but at the same time, trying to limit some of the exploitation that we saw with the visitor passes. Uh, in addition to that, we did create our proposed creation of a series of new non-resident permits for things like medical caretakers, if you're having in-home care, child care, if you are a family that is have, has an in-home nanny or, or, or babysitter, um, contractors. So understanding that, you know, if you're having your house painted or something short term, that you, you, the use of the visitor pass would be, uh, you know, possible. But if you have contractors working on a permit for your house, Typically, those are longer term, uh, you know, longer, you know, longer term projects, and you know, setting up so that contractors can be able to park their vehicles within an RPP area without getting ticketed. Uh, and the last, and you know, and, and I know there's some questions on this, are you know, is a landlord permit where you know people who own properties within an RPP area would be able to obtain a permit. For you know, for some of the purposes that they need to, to use in a permit in a permit district, um, so you know those would be things like um, you know like work that you know work that uh, those companies do to their houses, uh, especially in you know in you know routine maintenance, leasing, uh, other things that typically uh, take beyond the grace period of time. Um, an another item that was a focus of the code changes. Uh, was the introduction of hybrid RPP areas. And what this is, is that it is an, op, you know, it's, cr it's creating an option for, uh, for communities to become hybrid areas. And if they become hybrid areas, uh, what that would mean that it is instead of a grace period, so in, in most of our districts, we have either one or two hour grace periods, uh, where people can park for an hour or two hours without, for free in a residential permit parking area. Uh, what we're proposing is that if a, if an area chooses to be uh, chooses to want to be a, a hybrid parking area, uh, and city council approves them being being one, uh, that then we could you know we could instead of people being able to park for one or two hours for free, everyone who did not have a permit or one of these non-resident permits would have to pay to park in the RPP area, and you know that was it, that was created um, is specifically focused or within areas like Oakland, uh, where there are institutional, you know, large institutional pressures, um, you know, to 
stop users from from part, you know, hoping to deter users from parking in the RPP areas because they think it would because of the prospect of free parking uh, and parking in the, you know, in the district in, in the district where those institutions, uh, you know, are instead and in and in off street parking areas uh, that are in in those districts instead of moving into the residential areas. Uh, then the final piece uh, that we've been talking about, um, which is not a part of the code amendment, but related is that we have been talking about the changes to fees. Uh, the fee for residential permit parking is $20 annually, which is the same cost that it has been since the inception of the program in 1981. Um, you know, with that, um, you know, the, a lot of the discussion has not been on really, uh, you, know, you know, substantially or even changing the, the $20 fee, uh, but implementing a progressive fee structure so that, you know, for example, if your first car is $20, your second car is $40, and your third car is $80, trying to create a disincentive uh, to, you know, the allowance of multiple, you know, of, of people with multiple cars, but understanding that, you know, there, you know, for every place that we have maybe, you know, three or potentially more students living in a house, um, we also have families with teenagers that might have multiple cars and might need multiple cars and trying to trying to address a situation that allows for a deterrent, you know, a, a disincentive for the one while still allowing the other. Um, that is a very quick overview of, uh, of the changes. I know there were questions, uh, Andrea, that you and, uh, you know, and, and, and others had sent along. I'm happy to walk through those or if you want to ask those or if there are other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Why don't you start with the ones um, that were sent to you? Sure. They, cover, they cover a bit. Yeah, so, you know, the first one is, the first one that was sent was how does the city plan on ha handling RPP areas that are currently uh, oversubscribed? I think actually you stated wildly oversubscribed, so I'll, I'll read it directly. Um, and I mean, the, the, answer, the answer is, the, the intention of the program is to preserve residential parking for residents. Uh, I think there is an understanding that, you know, in some districts, we, you know, have more, you know, we have the potential for having more cars because the residents have more cars than we have on street parking. Uh, and, you know, and, and so, you know, we're, we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to manage that piece. What we are trying to do is make sure that the residential parking that is in these areas is preserved for residents. And that's where, you know, some of these changes to, um, you know, to allowance of hybrid areas, uh, to uh, some of the, you know, to some of the other changes, you know, is to further that. Um, but it's not to get into, all right, well, you know, there are only, 300 on-street parking spaces, so we're only allowing for 300 permits. Um, you know, we, we, we chose, you know, I mean, you know, we chose not to do that because, you know, for, for a number of reasons, um, you know, to, you know, so, you know, so that we weren't trying to manage things in that way, but are trying to preserve those areas of, you know, in the residential area, in the residential districts for residential parking. Can you hold on for one second, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I was in the process of cooking dinner right before this, and so I have a child going to take care of that for me. Um, Solidarity. <laughs> um, a how second... does, on that question, on that note, I mean, on that one, sure. how does giving non-resident permits and possibly making it hybrid preserve it for residents? It sounds well, like that would make it harder. With the hybrid areas, I mean, the intention is that, you know, if people have to pay to park in those areas, they will be less likely to pay. They will be less likely to park in those areas, right? Um, and so if, 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 if I know that, enforcement. if I know that I can come into, if I know that I can come into, you know, to area C and, and park for free during the grace period, you know, or, or if, if it becomes if it becomes a hybrid area, which is a decision of the community and ultimately approved by the city council, um, you know that you know if you so choose to, then I might be less likely to park in there, park in that RPP area during that grace period if I know that I've got to pay, not a meter, but you know like you know the pay pay through the app, for example, and I have to pay 
the same hourly rate as I'd have to pay, you know, if I was parking on a, you know, if I was parking on another street in the district that was not residential, or if I was parking in a garage, um, that it would it would encourage me to then park on a metered street or I, or or in a garage as opposed to parking in a residential permit parking area as a non-resident. All right, question two. <laughs> Move on to the next question. All right. I just make a uh, point. The, next... so the other thing, the other problem with that is without proper enforcement, neither one solves anything. Well, and I, you know, I mean, I mean, we can talk about enforcement all night. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, you know, we've definitely heard a lot about enforcement through the public process and, and prior meetings. Um, you know, we, we, under, we understand that there are, that, that there are things there to, to continue to work through. Millie? I have a question and, and it uh, relates to what Elena had asked too. I don't understand how the, um, the, the landlord passes benefits me as a resident that lives well, there. I think uh, there's a yeah. question. I think there are a series of questions on that later and maybe, okay. we, right. you know, I'll, I'll leave that to uh, okay. Elena or Andrea uh, as to how you want me to proceed, but let's proceed. Would you like to hold off on that Elena or? Um, no, let's proceed in order and okay. we'll, That'll be yeah. a big topic. Sure. Uh, the second item, or the second question was, can an existing RPP area request a parking study? And so, you know, I guess maybe I, I might ask what, so the answer is yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the slightly longer answer is if, for example, an RPP, if, for example, we wanted to change the hours in area D or want to change the grace period in that area, um, you know, that would be something that, um, you know, could be under, under what's proposed could now be triggered by a number of different ways instead of just the petition process. So, you know, it could be a community organization you're reaching out to their council member to, you know, to have this be something that's pursued. It could be, you know, again, you know, those, the, the neighborhood plan or the parking permit officer that they can initiate that process as well. Um, so there is a way for that to happen. Uh, and there, there, there are more ways for that to happen under what's proposed uh, than, than what's presently in the code. Uh, third item, or third question, uh, since nearly all of Central Oak Oakland and Oak Cliff have residential permit parking areas and are within half a mile of an EMI district, can they opt out of being considered for a hybrid area? If not, then what is the appeal process? So what's, in, what's, in, what's being proposed in the code is just creating the option for hybrid per RPP areas. There's nothing in that that mandates that all of those districts have to, be re have to be hybrid areas. So those would be discussions that after this code passes, if this, you know, like when, you know, obviously I'm hoping that this code passes because I've worked on it for some time, um, you know, so I'm just gonna be optimistic and say, after this passes, then it is the decision of the community and the residents in that area as to if they want to become a hybrid parking area. When the code passes, when the code passes, you're the same as you are today with a grace period. But the, the neighborhood, grace period, the grace period doesn't change. The district doesn't change. City council would have to approve those areas becoming hybrid parking, hybrid RPP areas before we could put up signs and make people pay through an app as opposed to having a free grace period. So that those would be future decisions of, you know, of the community of the city council member. Uh, you know, of city council to, you know, to, to move forward. So the answer is you don't have to be a hybrid area if you don't want to, but if you choose to, you now have an option to where before you didn't have that option at all. But what if the neighborhood plan um, suggests it, that, that the residents didn't, you know, didn't want it, and it came out in the neighborhood plan or the parking enforcement officer suggests it? City council has to approve that taking place. So it's, it's all, I mean, it's all a decision of city council and it's a decision that is made with public hearings at the planning commission and meetings with registered community organizations, all, you know, those things are all outlined in the code. So there, there is proper, there is proper community process before that happens, before, yeah, before city council would be able to make a decision to, to allow that to happen. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure that your council member, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, is, is one who will listen to, you know, 
to, to you relative to items on residential permit parking. Um, you know, I, you know, I definitely have a lot of those, the, the, you know, those same comments that, that are made to me, uh, forwarded to me from council members as well. Um, so, so, so the answer is, you know, again, the, the, um, the, the short answer is yes, they can opt out. Uh, the long answer was kind of what I gave. Anything else there before I move on? No. All right. Uh, next question. Both parking authority and Domi said if additional personnel will be necessary. Have funds for that been allocated? Will permit fees cover that? Um, the answer to that is really out of my control in the Department of City Planning. Um, so I, I don't want to give you a confident answer there. Um, I will say, however, in my discussions with city council members, um, they are working with the parking authority to understand, you know, there, there was a position that was dedicated in the parking authority to the operations of this program uh, that, you know, would be more around, um, you know, the work that city planning presently does. Um, if, that, if that function does not exist at the parking authority and instead moves to Domi, there are discussions of, you know, how, you know, either funding or that position specifically could move to Domi to be able to have de a dedicated staffer for uh, the administration of the program. Um, it, you know, obviously that is a part of council's deliberations with the budget. So, you know, I cannot say that for certain, but I do know in my conversations that that's where the discussion has been. So uh, the answer is yes, people are actively working to create dedicated staff for administration of the program. Uh, number five, or I'm sorry, anything else there before I move, keep going. And that, there might be a question later about this, uh, but uh, you, so far the only discussion is about fees, but how about increasing the fines and having that pay for extra personnel? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, like that has been discussed as well. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the, you know, one of the reasons we, none of the fines or nor fees have been changed in the, I think that actually the fines might have been changed once uh, when we introduced the changes to, which doesn't affect Oakland, uh, but we did it, we did increase uh, the fines in areas around the stadium uh, because area G, which is near Heinz Field, um, it, the residential permit parking fines were actually cheaper than trying to get a parking space around Heinz Field. Um, so we did try to rectify that issue. Um, however, you know, since the fees and the fines were all dictated in the code, it's very difficult to change them. And so what we're actually doing is looking to move them out of the code and into the fee schedule uh, that the city has. And I know that you all talked about it went relative to rental registration just a little bit earlier, but you know, the idea is that city council passes a fee schedule every year. And so that has, you know, for example, you know, I, as the director of the Department of City Planning, we do permitting. Anytime that our permit fees change, they do so and council has to approve those as part of the budget. The same thing would happen with uh, residential permit parking, both the permits and the fines, uh, that they would be able to be dictated by that fee schedule instead. So it does allow for greater flexibility, but at the same time, oversight by your city council uh, before those could be changed. So the next question was around time frame for the decisions by the planning commission and that changing from 60 to 90 days. Um, that was that was essentially done to be in line with, uh, you know, with um, you know the rest of the items that go before the planning commission. Um, so it was, you know, I mean, having residential permit parking, uh, you know, have one process and have having a zoning change or a, you know something else that's going to the planning commission have another, um, you know, have another was you know was was is trying to clarify it from an administrative perspective and make it easier on us. I mean, is is really what it comes down to. Um, yes, they can still get extensions um, if, if, for example, there are things that we need to work out uh, through the public process around particular changes to a district. And, so, and, and again, Planning Commission is only making a recommendation to City Council. They're not making a decision on changes to an RPP area. Next, is there any opportunity to work at, at this point for amendments to the bill? And the answer is yes. I'm not the person to talk to about that, though. Um, yeah. So th those are those are with uh, your city council members. Uh, since the bill has been introduced to city council, um, 
you know, city council would be the one that would have to make amendments to the bill. I mean, obviously there are discussions based on all of the things that have been mentioned in all of the, you know, in the public meetings and the surveys and things like that to date, um, you know, around potential amendments, um, you know, council is the one to ultimately make those amendments. Visitor passes was the next question. Um, question, or I guess it was more of a statement uh, than a question, but just- a Clarification. Uh, a visitor pa permit would allow a visitor to park for 12 days every four, or every month, which means a student with Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes could park for free in a residential area throughout the year. Um, this was, I mean, there was a lot of discussion on this um, as to limitations. I mean, the 12 days is a, is, is a limitation that we don't have now. Um, so it is, it is further, you know, it is definitely uh, further limiting what would have happened now where, you know, the opportunity with the three days on one day off would actually allow somebody, um, you know, would, would allow somebody to park in a, in a district on a visitor pass. I think it's like 22 days in a month, you know, or 23 days in a month potentially. So it does further limit that, um, you know, yes, the situation in which you outlined is a potential and you know and I, and I think that we we did try to continue to limit that but um you know to go below that would be something that you know again would be an amendment that i would you know if that was something that you all wanted to pursue um you know working with your council member to make that as an amendment um then anything else on that before i move to landlord permits mm. all right landlord permits um uh, a landlord owning company owning property in a given area would be allowed a permit for themselves, one for a registered company vehicle, and three permits for the renters in a single family home for a total of five permits compared to a homeowner who is only allowed three. Is this right? How many non-resident permits could a landlord get for a given area if they owned 10 rentals, five cars, and three property managers? Um, so I didn't have time to do the math on this one. Uh, to, to, to be completely fair, um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have time to be able to do the calculations over, you know, o over this. Um, what I will say is, um, you know, I mean, yes. Uh, you know, yes, there would be no different for a the number of permits that a renter would be able to have on a property than a property owner. So, so if you if you I'm sorry than a than a homeowner. So if you if you if you own your home uh, and you live in it, you have the same amount of you have you have the same rights to the same number of permits as if you rent that home, and you know and you and, and you you know you live there but you don't own it. Um, so in a, you know, four properties that are rentals, um, the landlord would be able to have a permit beyond that to park in that area for, you know, for the purposes of, you know, being able, you know, being able to do work on that property. Um, and the way that, uh, you know, the way that the, you know, the permit is presently, you know, is presently written up or presently proposed, um, you know, is that, you know, they have to, you know, they have to provide documentation of ownership of that property. Um, they have to provide documentation that the property is being offered as a rental. And, you know, if they choose, if they do those things, um, you know, they may, if they are an individual owner, they may receive one, you know, one permit for the, you know, for themselves to be able to park in that permit district. If they are a company, if they are, you know, if, if it is a company and that company owns vehicles, then the company vehicles may obtain permits within, with, with, within a district to be, you know, to be able, you know, for the purposes of, you know, of being able to you know, to work you know, to park in the district for work that they are doing on on properties, um, you know. So, so you know. So I mean, you know. So if you know, in the hypothetical that you know that a 
that a, a company that owns rental rental properties, um, you know, had five cars, um, you know, that that were different. I mean, they would have the opportunity to get permits for those cars to park within the district. Is that does that answer? I, I, you know, I, there was a lot to that question, so I want, I, you know, I want to, I want to be able to, you know, I want to make sure that I answered the question that you were asking, uh, and then, if, you know, I'm happy to kind of, you know, answer any follow-ups. Right. I don't, I don't understand that one at all, uh, Director Dash, because I mean, you, you know, our neighborhood in, in Oak Cliff, and we have so many, so many landlords. And that would just, um, I don't know, double the, um, I, I, I don't even understand the math of it. But for, let, let's say we have, um, I don't know, 100 homes and, and 80 of those are, uh, are rentals. Now already, well, I don't know, I, I don't even want to think about the math. All it means is that my poor neighbor who lives at 300 Ophelia Street will never be able to park anywhere near her house. Uh, you know, it's just impossible. I, I don't see how you can give any justification for that at all. Because a, right now, because we have a grace period, and at one point, Oak Cliff had even asked, wanted our grace period to be um, reduced to half an hour. But I could see, like, okay, maybe an hour. So I'm a landlord in, in um, Oak Cliff as well. And that would give, an hour gives me plenty of time to um, show somebody, a, a workman, who, uh, in fact, I had one the other day to look at uh, windows that need to repla be replaced in one of my houses. It would give me time to show an apartment to a prospective tenant. An hour is a long time. Um, and, and, and right now, I, I know you wanna get away from variances because it's a lot of labor, but that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's the most sensible way. If I know that I'm gonna have some plumbing done, I, I can call in the morning and say, okay, here's my plumber. It was a bit of a pain in the neck to say what kind of car the plumber had, what the plumber's license number was, what color the car was, and so forth. But at least I could call at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning and get a pass for that person, and they'd be okay for the whole day. Uh, and so I don't understand. I just do not understand how you can justify uh, giving permits to landlords and um and, and rental companies' um, um, maintenance cars. And I also have a question, I hope you're gonna get into it, about Airbnb. I mean, at the hearing you had the other day, uh, there was a guy from the South Side who was talking about how he felt his Airbnbs would be giving relief to, um, to neighbors rather than taking up places. But we had a potential Airbnb in Oak Cliff and, um, and, and I could see that that could be happening in the, in the future if your new proposal gives them latitude to get three or four or five or six or however many rooms they're renting out in, in their buildings. I would like you to talk about Airbnbs in particular. You're wrong about this one. Take it off your, take it off the slate. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just to respond to some of the landlord pieces, you know, I, I you know, I mean, I understand that, you know, I mean, you know, this is a difference of opinion. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's been stated um, on this one. I mean, you know, I don't think that, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, the opportunity is there for people, to, you know, as to how landlords that are working on properties, which does tend to typically happen within the hours of an RPP district, um, you know, that, you know, most, most of our RPP districts are, you know, some, you know, operate between the hours of 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. generally. Um, there are obviously districts in Oakland and other places that have hours that go beyond that, um, but it is the same time that a lot of those, uh, you know, that of those things are going on. Um, and, you know, we're trying to create an opportunity for that. I think that, you know, ultimately there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of feedback that's been given and it will be, you know, I think city council will, will ultimately be the one to determine, um, you know, whether or not um, that proposal comes through as, as a part of ultimately what gets approved. I hate to cut this short now, but we do have a lot more on our um, agenda. But I know, Director Dash, that you have um, a, an email or a website for further questions on this. We do, and I can put that in the chat. Please put um, that in yeah. the chat. 
Yeah, and 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 so you know all of all of the you know the the items from the you know the items from the public uh, you know meetings are there. Um, we have recordings of our virtual meetings that that are there. Um, we have the legislation there. Um, you know, my email is I think on there as well. So I mean, you know, I mean, if there, you know, I, I we are we are going through this process to take feedback and you know and, and you know and and discussing that feedback with council members as they work to. Um, you know, determine what edits need to be made uh, before bringing this bill to a vote. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat and, you know, we can, uh, you know, like I said, go from there or, and, you know, as Elena and Millie know, because they've now, they've now been in a couple of these meetings uh, with me uh, that have been community meetings, you know, if there are other community organizations uh, that, you know, wish to, you know, either ask questions or, you know, we, we will definitely try to accommodate that. And I've been trying to go to meetings, uh, you know, when I can. So, um, you know, I try to make myself available as well. So thanks. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our air quality update by Breathe Pittsburgh. And I believe Matthew, are you still with us? Oh, I think. Yeah, there I'm you. here. You are. Yeah, thanks. I, I can only be here for about like a minute where I have to go pick up my daughter now. But I just want to say hi. Thank you very much for inviting well, uh, Christine and me to this meeting. Christine has some content, um, so she'll be sharing that. Um, but in any event, um, I want to thank you all for, for inviting us. Um, we have some things that are underway that is um, evolving from grassroots community groups throughout parts of the city to address ongoing air quality issues. Uh, it's actually across the county, but uh, we've been doing talks like this in different neighborhoods throughout the city. And it's and it involved, there are ways that people can get involved. And so we really welcome that. Um, we still have a serious air quality problem in our region from multiple sources. You know, Oakland, there are a number of, of, of sources that are impacting you. Um, and so we welcome your engagement and I'll be happy to follow up with people um, and I'm going to pass it off to Christine because I do have to run, but I want to thank you for inviting us both here. And Christine, uh, have, have some fun. I apologize <laughs> that we were running late. That's okay. I understand. Um, it's, it's nice to be invited and, I'm, and we'll be happy to, to come back again with an update sometime. So thanks. Thank you. Christine? Hi. Hi. Thanks for, for having us. Um, if I could share screen, I just have popped a few things into some slides that I think would help illustrate the updates. Um, it says it's disabled, so I'm not sure if someone could give me permission, but um, I'll just uh, very quickly say that um, I know many of you were very likely here over the summer when Matt and I gave um, a, an overview of the concerns uh, around the Birmingham Bridge site um, with the asphalt plant there and the uh, cement plant and the fact that the asphalt plant was uh, coming up for permit renewal, um, their uh, existing permit has actually expired and they're sort of on a um, administrative um, extension of sorts until their uh, permit review hearing um, comes up and, and they're granted their next five-year permit. And with the numerous complaints about uh, relative to odor coming um, in about that particular site, um, we had, you know, embarked on a data collection process, um, installing monitors in various parts of the community uh, with, you know, community members being the hosts of those monitors. Um, and CMU drove its mobile lab out to collect samples near the plant um, and, and around and in the community. And we had some on the ground observers who utilized the bike path uh, going by there who were regularly reporting sort of qualitative observations, both photographically and in um, description and making uh, smell complaints and, and Allegheny County Health Department complaints when warranted. So. We received information from them whether or not it was um, smelly or, or or it wasn't. So so it was interesting to see how many times they reported in and how many of those times were um, 
their experience was with noxious odors. So let me just see if I can share now. Yep, it's working. Just give me a second to tee this up. And um, so, you know, Liz Gray has been coming to our um, meetings where we've been discussing sort of the impact potentially of this site on um, air quality in the communities of Uptown, uh, Oakland, Shadyside, um, the Southside Flats, um, the Hill District, and members from all of those uh, communities have been participating in those meetings, and we've been uh, attending some of their community meetings and learning more also about the other issues of concern, not just around that one point source, but um, relative to idling vehicles, uh, relative to construction sites and the air quality issues around um, those and ones that are coming uh, down the pike in the future. Um, so let me just share a quick summary of what that looks like. I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble pulling this up. There we go. This should work. Can, are you seeing, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Uh -oh. So just to remind you, like it, from the summer, some of the interim actions we identified were more people using the Smell PGH app, signing up and using it, reporting out to the Allegheny County Health Department. Um, like I just mentioned, we were able to accomplish more photographic observation documentation, um, more um, experiential stories and sharing out. There was a artist, Aaron Henderson, who compiled stories from all of the communities that I mentioned and has been doing a visual art piece actually um, throughout the city regarding air quality um, that has kind of come and gone already. Uh, he was, he, it was um, a digital imagery projection on, on in various galleries and, and buildings and that may circle back around again. So if there are particular community members who you think would like to share their lived experience relative to air quality, I can put you in touch with him as he moves into the next um, phase. Uh, monitor host signups and acquisitions, That's uh, that was an action item and we were able to get two, three monitors up in Oakland. Um, we have struggled a bit collectively with keeping them online. They've been going on and offline for a variety of reasons. So consistency in getting those monitors to provide readings on a regular uh, basis without going offline has been a bit of a challenge. Um, but we continue to, to uh, target more um, host signups. Um, we're participating in these monthly or check-ins, um, coming to meetings and so forth. And for a while we were reviewing the data. Uh, we were having a separate meeting where neighbors were invited to just look at the data coming from the monitors. We put that on pause as the data was um, becoming somewhat inconsistent for, for a period. So we're hoping to restart those. And then as we look for project opportunities to integrate air quality and data collection and improvements. Um, in your community, Liz really identified the construction sites as a big concern and Carlo University um, also um, uh, identified that as a, as a concern. Um, so what we, I, I'm just, um, I jumped ahead a little bit here, but the, um, what has evolved out of all of this activity since we last saw you is um, we've decided not to really go with a publicly facing um, cry for action, but rather to try and interface with the manager of the Lindy plant. Two of us were able to get um, in a very good and very productive conversation with him on site when we were sort of scouting the perimeter to see if some of the concerns expressed by residents were valid um, and where the smell could be coming from. And we identified parts of the plant where we think uh, the emissions are, are, are sort of escaping and leaving the boundaries, um, including the silo uh, area when they release the material into the trucks. That seems to be a real hot spot on the site for um, 
emissions release. And uh, um, so long and short, he seemed very open to a conversation. And PJ Dick is um, a very green company overall. They own the, the operations there. And our understanding is that they have a, a very strong commitment to sustainability. And it seems fairly genuine and authentic. And they may just not understand that there is such a regular, um, uh, I guess, <laughs> emissions concern at that particular site. And so we're gonna we're gonna go the route of trying to work with them, letting them know where what the observations have been over the course of a season, how frequently smells have been detected, what we've observed, what the CMU lab um, results looked like, and see see what they say. Maybe they'd be willing to to work on finding um, new ways of operating that would minimize that. Um, Sue Seppi from GASP was able to identify some best practices used in other plants um, around the country. And she believes that there are a few um, systems that could be integrated here without knowing fully how that plant operates uh, yet, uh, but just from observation that, that could help put a damper on, on the VOCs or at least mitigate the smell. Um, so, so that's underway, that letter, is being finalized this week and should be sent out next week. We have a draft of it. If anyone would like to see it and, and give input, um, I'd be happy to send the link to you. Um, Perla University has, has um, engaged all of their faculty um, that they feel have uh, an interest in this kind of air quality issue. And we'll be doing a tour of the campus with their facilities person and um, and their, their faculty members who are interested, identifying where monitors can go up at the university. They are going to fund those um, through a sort of a, a, a grant application process. Um, so the Breathe Project will um, apply with the students for um, the funding and then and then they will uh, hopefully refund the, the cost that was put out for the monitors. Um, and then they're going to integrate it as a teaching tool with their students. So the students will be learning how to use the monitors, um, how to read data, look for patterns, and um, come up with ideas for improving air quality in and around campus. So they have a big construction project coming down the pike on Fifth Avenue, and um, they've expressed that uh, their interest in that site um, minimizing air pollution during construction and um, it having a greener footprint. So this is sort of a inroad into that discussion. Um, the green team uh, with UPMC and McGee Women's Hospital, we've reached out to them and they're very interested in putting up monitors um, and and looking at what the air is doing on the inside as well as on the outside, how they can be good community members in, in that way and participating in this um, air quality network build out. So we have the information out to them and they're ringing it up the ladder to see if they can um, buy some of these monitors and get them installed both inside and outside. Um, and then one interesting thing that's come up, uh, as the asphalt plant has ramped down for the season, those who have been observing on the ground have noticed that one of the odors that has been consistently present throughout the season seems to actually be coming from the adjacent steel fabrication facility. So now that the asphalt plant has damped down, which was contributing, um, it seems uh, from, from folks' experience, there seems to be another layer uh, coming from the steel fabrication site next door. Uh, so that's something that's now on the radar to see if we can parse out some of the, the data and look a little more carefully. Um, and then uh, Liz has identified construction sites and I will show you those in a second. I did wanna show you this. This is sort of a, just a snapshot of the way we're starting to compile the data. You can't see the headers here, I just realized, but what we've done is whenever we're getting a qualitative on the ground report from um, a, a resident of, about smell complaints, uh, we note the date. Um, we 
note there in this column all the way to the right um, their exact words we, we put this in how they've described it um, and then we have someone from CMU uh, Albert Presto who has his finger on all the air quality data in the um, area he just goes through this pretty quickly um, for now this is sort of first pass what you're seeing here and um, compares uh, the notation to the background data. So like in, in the case of September 21st, um, you were seeing uh, on the monitors nearby that he has the ramp monitors, PM and CO were increasing that morning, um, slightly before a similar increase downtown. And then by afternoon, the two sites become similar. So that's giving us some context for maybe some background pollution that may be um, being detected or influencing uh, what, how we're reading the data. And then the CREATE lab at CMU has been able to do something interesting when the qualitative data has been paired with a smell report. So for example, on September 27th, um, there was a smell report. Uh, we, we received some qual qualitative data that, that it was stinky air. Um, somebody was having that experience and they that they submitted a smell report both at 8.34 and 9.30 p.m. Create Lab was able to do this by looking at the direction of the wind. They were able to see, project as the smell reports were coming in, um, how that smell, if it was originating as experienced from the asphalt plant site, the direction that those particulates would move and who would be experiencing uh, the smell most intensely. And this is kind of interesting because as you can see, the smell reports come in right near the site, in the asphalt site, and their projections show that it should be sort of like, you know, in that yellow stream that you're seeing. And then you see up upwind, you see that those two smell reports pop up, right, in that band and not much else, um, except for that one down to the Southeast. So. That this is the data collection going on around this site is allowing the Create Lab to try new things and parse out some of the overall data that's being collected to better identify what is causing um, air quality, where the air quality concerns, where the sources are, and how much they're contributing to people's experience. Um, so let me see if I can get back to that other slide. Um, oop. Okay. Anybody know how to, once I'm, <laughs> once I've been here in this little thing I clicked on, how to get back? Um, okay. Well, hang on one second. There we go. Okay, um, so these are the construction sites that Liz identified as um, current or coming down the pike very roughly. And so that gives um, an opportunity to set a baseline there um, and to look at post-construction baseline or current baseline and, um, I'm sorry, pre and post. Uh, so we've talked about um, seeking funding for some of those monitors. They range from 225 uh, if we get refurbished ones to if we want to monitor with um, a sort of more sensitive monitor coming out of CMU's Create Lab. Those cost somewhere upward of 325. Um, we're putting in a bulk order for 10 monitors, two of which will be distributed to Oakland um, and, and two to uh, upland, uh, Uptown, another two to the Hill District. Um, so Breathe Project is contributing a few in the short term. So, you know, in addition to those and the ones going up at Carlo, there will be some new monitors up. But if, um, if, if you all want to collaborate on figuring out, um, you know, how to monitor those sites more closely, that every, everyone seems pretty open to that. 
We've also um, revamped um, how we are screening for hosts for the monitors. Um, and we've created a Google form which acts to give information to the interested party um, and feeds it back to us in a way that makes the whole process more efficient um, and, and more informative. Um, I can share that link with anyone um, if you, you know, want to reach out on behalf of, of other community. Um, if you as a community want, member want to find other community members who might be interested in hosting a monitor, that could be a good tool for you. Um, and I'm happy to share that. The other um, final thing here that is uh, going on um, and worth noting it's relative to some town halls that have been being held uh, with Breathe Project support, but very much grassroots resident led. The most recent one was focused on the healthcare community, asking them to really get involved with some of these air pollution concerns um, as a preventative measure. And um, I am trying to link to a website that they have recently put up. Um, these will be going on throughout 2022. And um, so keep, you know, this is a good maybe link to post, you know, on the general websites that you utilize for um, all the branch out groups in Oakland. And as, as a tool, there's a petition here asking the healthcare community to to really uh, speak out about the air pollution related uh, health problems that we are experiencing, um, both you know from larger sources like the cookworks to um, to the asphalt uh, plant, just sort of just getting in the fray with everyone and asking our regulators and our um, representatives to. Uh, to take stronger action. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, and let's see, I think the only other thing I, I wanted to bring up and in the interest of time, I'll be really brief. Um, you know, a lot of the concerns, uh, many of the concerns we're hearing from community members as, as we started to talk about the asphalt plant are centering around um, mobile corridors. And this map, you may have seen it already, it's from Albert Presto's work uh, at CMU, and it shows black carbon concentrations um, and their hotspots throughout our, our county. And, um, and particularly in the, in the greater Pittsburgh area, you can see that some communities are disproportionately affected by these black carbon concentrations, um, which have serious health implications. Those fine particles really lodge in the tissues of our, our body, um, particularly impacting lung function. And increasingly, the data is showing that it, it has impact on, on brain development in young children and mental and behavioral health. Um, the, uh, the, why this is relevant I think you know it really ties into some of the concerns we've heard from Liz, and we've been talking about relative to idling vehicles, um, construction sites, and so forth. And you know, so in addition to this kind of top-down approach of like, well, how can we change the regulators' approach um, and and curb some of these things at the source? There's also the sort of shorter-term solution of how can we mitigate risk and one of the projects of um, of the Breathe Collaborative is is solution based, and it's focused on tree planting to mitigate mobile corridor um, pollution. And it is um, not so much um, just you know the, our typical street trees, but but really looking at creating um, kind of green wall, very strategically designed and selected species to help um, to mitigate that risk. Uh, when there's a population on the other side of that roadway that may, you know, be spending time outdoors, um, whether it be on the streetscape or in a little pocket park or a green space or a, in a, you know, daycare, a playground or whatnot. And I know that you've been focusing on tree planting um, and that's on your agenda tonight. So I just wanted to end with that, that um, if that is of interest, we can help um, potentially um, 
you know, design the tree planting efforts with you in order to mitigate some of the um, the the problems coming from the, the mobile corridors and work with the air quality monitors going up to, to establish a baseline and then look at the trees as more of a health intervention, a medical intervention, as, as opposed to, you know, just a beautification measure and, um, and then measure the uh, impacts accordingly. So in one community, for example, we are measuring impacts on behavioral and mental health through surveys um, that are designed by U.S. Forest Service researchers. Um, so that that has interesting implications for the larger um, sort of healthcare investment in our communities type uh, movement that's going on at, at, at really at a national scale right now. So, um, so that's it. That's all I have. And I'm open to questions. I hope I didn't take up too much time. Um, thanks for, for letting us share out. Thank you. It's good to know um, somebody is watching our air quality. If you could drop um, in the chat um, the information, if we want to report something. Absolutely. Um, oh, there they are. Well, these are, um, so the Smell app is a good place, but more and more we're learning that the health department respects complaints directly through to their lines. So I'll drop that um, link in there too. But if you do want to see which monitors are out there and what they're saying, you can look at any time. They're all public. And these are the three monitors, uh, monitoring sites. The environmentaldata.org um, is a project to bring all the monitors together on one map, essentially. So you'll see a big aggregate there. The AirViz um, is, is really just looking at a, a VOC monitor that's produced by a, a CMU spinoff in the area. Um, and the purple air is really a national um, effort. Uh, and, and you can see any, you can type in your zip code or type in a zip code of anywhere in the country and you can see where the monitors are there. And th that's primarily uh, PM uh, monitoring. And, and there's a new VOC add-on that we've been purchasing, but that is not showing up on the maps just yet, but it may, but the AirViz is VOC. So I will drop the Smell PGH and the um, Allegheny County Health Department uh, link. Andrea already, I think Andrea already is. Oh, she did. Okay, um, super. Sorry, I can't see that. Possible, is it possible to ask a question? Sure, yeah, of course. First of all, I applaud all of your efforts um, Thank you. I'm really happy to hear about all your efforts. Um, this is something that I've been looking at for studying for the last eight years because of the particulate matter. I live on Dawson, and so my backyard is happens to be Shenley Park and all the trees. Um, in the past, I contacted an arbiter, looked at tree planting, and one of the concerns that I have with tree planting and leads to my question is that um, this area has the highest rate of sinusitis according to um, ENT in our immunology department and CDC in the world, not in the country, in the world. Um, and what happens is a lot of times we are planting the wrong kind of tree. Right. Yeah. And, and because we don't, we, we plant more male to female because we don't want to clean up the female fruit. Therefore, we're really upsetting our eco balance. Aside from that, because of the particulate matter we have within the cities, the, um, the gas matters, the carbon, um, carbon particulates actually attach to the pollen. So it actually, with regards to health, creates more health problems for people that have allergies. And also, I've been informed there's something called spring suicide. So the combination of the particulate matter and the pollen combined off gases and creates a chemical cascade that really causes what they call insurgent uh, cephalopathy, allergic encephalopathy. And um, and it is reported not around the holidays, but around it's called it's literally called spring 
suicide and a lot of the health problems with it. So in essence, me saying all of this is that it's something I'd really, I would like to join your effort, but I would also like to see what people are doing to really look at it's not upsetting the eco balance with the good intention of, of planting trees to making sure that for the appropriate trees and over pollination doesn't cause more deaths due to the off gassing of the combination of fluorocarbons and um, pollen particles um, uniting. Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a good point. Um, we yeah, some trees do have higher VOC um, off gassing um, uh, potential than than others, uh, and pollen counts. And there are researchers who have been looking into that. Particularly, there's um, a study in Louisville, Kentucky, called Greenheart Louisville. It's the largest effort to medically intervene with. Um, trees, tree planting um, green in in the country, really the first of its kind to quantify that. And the work that's been done in the run-up to that um, has identified species that are lower in pollen count, but can also adhere particulates to the leaves um, of the trees uh, as well. So we have, we have some of that, and I'm sure uh, it would be great to have other eyes on it to review it um, of course, getting our particulate matter count down from our pollution sources would be our most ideal scenario. Um, but um, but when planting trees, I agree that should that should be considered as well. So um, we'd love to work with you on that and and hear more about what you've learned and collected and and combine it with what we have collected on this end too, and see see uh, what the most effective route might be. I, I so, think you wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm going to have you two are going to um, if you could connect offline, that would be helpful. We have still a lot of our agenda. I'm sorry to get yes, to. No, that's fine. I'm um, I'm Thank just you. putting my information in the um, email in the chat, my email in the chat. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our property watch list. Liz, I think you just wanted to highlight one property. Well, Liz, she's there. Here, here. Oh, she there. Um, oh, there she, she is. Okay. Maybe yeah. off camera for just a moment. I believe she needed to. Sorry. Yeah. There she is. Sorry about that. Um, the property I'm talking, I'm mostly concerned about is 2610 Forbes Avenue which is a city-owned property. It is condemned. It has been boarded up, and but it, it's just falling apart. We've got strips of siding that are flopping around in the wind. Sooner or later, we're going to have an accident on that ramp coming off the parkway, and somebody is going to get seriously hurt. So uh, if you're listening city council people, please, 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 can we make this a priority on the condemnation list? Uh, before something bad does happen. Also, I wanted to say that we have two cases coming up in the Common Pleas Court. One is 3221 Kennett Square, and that's regarding a single family occupancy permit. And the other is 537 Yarrow Street, formerly known as Zero Boundary Street. And that is on the retaining wall that we've been trying to get repaired for what, three years now. Uh, both of them are before the judge, Thomas Flaherty on December the 7th at 10.30 a.m. If anybody wants to join me, um, it's always an interesting experience and it really does help to have people from the community there. I'm done. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say about 2610 Forbes, you can still advocate for its demolition on the Engage Pittsburgh site. Thank you. Um, our summaries, um, zone four, I think Officer Schifrin um, couldn't stay with us this long, but the updates are on opdc.org um, slash oakwatch and public safety, John is not here as Rachel well. Weber is here. From I'm sorry. Rachel Weber is here from Public Rachel, Safety. Rachel, I'm sorry. 
Yes. Um, oh, I'm here from Nighttime Economy, and uh, we're in public safety, but I don't, I don't necessarily have um, public safety specific right. updates. Um, real quick, so yeah, we did have our um, Narcan training uh, a, a couple weeks ago for Circle Street folks. We had about 75 people attend, which was amazing. So thank you if anyone shared that out. Um, and a bunch of different restaurants from a lot of different areas. So uh, really happy to get that off the ground. And I think now Allison um, and I are going to be planning a training schedule for uh, hospitality businesses in 2022. So hearing from a lot of folks that like, um, and you know, I don't, I'm sure this is true in Oakland as well, that like a lot of like door security folks have changed over with the pandemic and things like that. Um, so we're looking into doing some like security training, some bouncer training to make sure that those folks, um, you know, are up to speed and, and, you know, avoid public safety issues before they do happen. Um, otherwise, just sort of discussing, um, you know, uh, outdoor dining and, and different things like that as we get into the winter. Um, and winterization of all of that stuff. And yeah, so not many updates from us, but um, again, happy to be here and, and thank you guys. And uh, of course, if you have any questions related to nighttime economy or um, you know questions related to the liquor control board or just hospitality things in general, um, I will put my email in the chat. So always here as a resource for you guys. Thank you, always appreciate it. Uh, the Pitt Police Officer Cunningham, do you have any comments for us? Uh, regarding, I think you got, you all sent an email regarding, um, 3815 Dawson about the, um, party that was held on, what was it, October 23rd, and you wanted to know if there were any, a, a report taken or whatnot. There was a report taken, and from what I read to the report, the officer spoke with the individual and notified them of the violations, um, that he can receive and he told them to shut the party down so i believe it was after 11 that the um the party was shut down so and um were any citations written nope there wasn't any citations there weren't any confrontation so i, I believe from what i've read that there was, they told them to turn off the music and that's what they did, so. Thank you. Um, on why was a live band? Why was, it, why was a live band with over 600 students what? saying to get in permitted? I, well, that, I mean, they, were, they were also advised if there was something like that in the future that they would need to get a permit for that. In the report, it didn't state how many students uh, there were when we, I conducted a knock and talk over there, which is a, an apartment building, and the individual who actually hosted the party don't live in that apartment building, used to, uh, but we had a talk with that person as well. But when we went there, some of the residents were there, they weren't there, it was just a, an individual who don't even live there. So, but he was advised of, um, like I said, the violations and requesting a, um, like a permit. You know, so. they contacted the property owner to tell them that such a thing would happen there? That, not that in would have been capital. That would have been well, not capital. Yes, I mean, there, and there were when we responded to people there last night, or more um they were charging people to get in and the officer the campus officer pulled up and said i'll have a talk with them mm -hmm. or underage students leaving getting in their car and driving drunk yeah well like i said i'm just reporting what was on the report and there was nothing else that evening or night night uh, regarding that situation, regarding that party. If they're, in a, we had a previous situation like this, when they're charging to get in and there's alcohol being provided, whether or not they say the, the, char the money given is for the band or whatever, um, the LCB, the L <laughs> Liquor Control Board um, got involved and that's um, what shut down one of our other music venues. Has this gone on more than once 
whoever is reporting. No, uh, regarding this Dawson yes. incident? Is this a repeat? I mean, are they having, are they becoming a music venue is what I'm asking. No, from my understanding, when I, when I spoke to an individual, I'm this was the last one. No, actually it wasn't the, the, the first time. They've had this before and this is the first time we've heard of it. Okay. So, but we have to watch this that. was the last one of the, of the, uh, let's just say season. Well, that remains to be seen, but okay. Um, thank you. I think that does it um, for our enforcement partners. And Andrea? Hey, are we ready to start, to start talking about trees? Ready to start talking about trees. Thank you so much. Um, to all of the Oak Watch updaters, that was extremely informative. We have an awful lot of notes. The minutes for the Oak Watch will be posted um, within a couple of days, as soon as Sam manages to sort out her, her transcript. Uh, we are going to talk, uh, and this is where it is, uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about trees. And uh, Rebecca, if you're still with us, it's been a while, sorry, we're a little bit um, behind in our schedule here, but uh, Rebecca Kiernan, who's the principal resilience planner in the Department of City Planning, um, has been taking a little bit of a speed crash course on all things trees with re regarding to Oakland. Um, uh, obviously, as a member of the Shade Tree Commission, is extremely familiar with how uh, the city manages uh, its tree programs and tree vitalize, um, but she's also been consulting with the planners who have been working with the uh, infrastructure team uh, for the Oakland plan um, to uh, uh, learn more about how uh, restoration of the Oakland tree canopy uh, is fitting into the Oakland plan process. Um, so Rebecca, if you're able to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Um, sure. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Thank a you. resilience planner with the city um, and here to uh, so I'm, I'm not working directly with the Oakland plan, but I've been briefed on it. Um, and I love trees and I work with trees all the time. So, um, you know, happy to take any, any questions or feedback or comments or anything back to the planning team, uh, that's working on the Oakland plan. Did you have a presentation you wanted to give or are you just here to talk comments? Oh, oh, we have a oh of yeah, questions. I think it's in here somewhere, but you guys have way better maps, um, than I do. Um, so, so yeah, I wasn't sure. City want... planning, so it's all good. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want to go to the next slide, um, so this is a, this is a map, and Andrea, I think your maps are actually way better. Um, this is from 2015, some data, but basically what this is showing is that, um, and you know, no surprise to everybody here, but um, it's it's been hard to pack trees into Oakland, um, especially you know the the built out area, the developed areas. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, so the, the Oakland neighborhood planning process is going on right now. Um, and trees are, are part of three different topics, which are within the neighborhood plan. So there's a bunch of different topics and working groups that people are working on. Um, but they, but trees, uh, as a, a topic appears in, um, green street network, um, hillsides, and then in the yard debris and compost programs. Go to the next one. Um, so one of the uh, recommendations that's coming out is a green street network. Um, so this is, uh, you know, focused on the benefits of wildlife, beautification, um, and li livability, stormwater management, heat island reduction. Obviously, we're missing air quality in here. Um, but, uh, you know, like we just heard from Christine, there's a lot of uh, really good benefits to, you know, certain trees in certain places. Um, so I know there's been a lot of discussion about the Lawn Street Greenway, which I think is actually called the Oak Cliff Greenway, um, but uh, basically creating this, this network. Um, so the, the Greenway, which goes around in that uh, U, the W shape in the bottom, um, and then also, uh, you know, lining these other streets uh, with trees and other greenery. Um, go ahead, you can go to the next one. Um, hillside management is also a big deal. I live at the bottom of, of Oakland in the run at the bottom of Greenfield. So um, I know that we have some pretty severe um, uh, hillside destabilization issues. 
Um, but, you know, tree plantings, uh, goats, uh, there's a lot of ways that, um, you know, we can manage the hillsides, which are, a lot of them are overtaken with uh, vines and invasive species, which is further destabilizing the hillsides, um, in addition to, you know, a, a lot of the um, climate uh, issues that we're seeing. So increased rainfall, freeze and thaw, that's all kind of wreaking havoc on our hillsides. Um, you know, clearing uh, some of those areas. Uh, goats have worked pretty well in, in some places. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, replanting those with trees to um, get a good root structure um, is a good way uh, to go about that. Um, I know they've also been talking about um, potential for buyouts, if that's necessary or wanted within the community. Um, amending the zoning code uh, to put limits on redevelopment um, on steep slopes, um, and then adding a restoration requirement for hillside disturbances. Um, so that that sounds like it would probably be, um, you know, something that's that's monetary. Uh, so if there is development on a hillside, could that funding then be uh, allocated towards uh, restoration? And then you can go to the next one. And then yard debris and compost. Um, I envision that this is probably a good use for wood chips. Um, so there's been discussion about uh, supporting and expanding composting efforts, piloting uh, yard waste uh, pickup, or allowing for um, you know a network of uh, composting, uh, composting and, and uh, urban garden areas. I know has been talked about a lot in the neighborhood plan. Um, so yeah. Uh, and I, I think that that was the last um, of the uh, the recommendations that are starting to come out of the Oakland plan. Yeah, before I get into some other stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is I, this is what your neighbors are talking about um, within the planning process. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities to, um, and I should have put the uh, Engage PGH uh, website on here, um, but I can drop it in the chat. Um, but there are opportunities to, um, you know, uh, fill out, um, you know, interest uh, forms or whatever online um, and participate virtually. If you've missed any of the meetings, I know that all of the, um, the uh, you know, we have Zoom meetings and videos and all kinds of things that are recorded on Engage PGH. It's been a really great tool. Um, but I'm also happy to take any feedback on, you know, anything that's missed um, here. I know, uh, you know, Christine just talked about a lot of really good work um, where trees could, you know, take, take part um, in our air quality issues. So, um, yeah, I can pause here and see if there's any questions before I get into the last two slides that I was going to talk about, because it kind of switches topics. I just want to make a note that the, um, the, these topics that you're talking about here are even in slightly in advance of draft form, and so there's still an awful lot of opportunity for people to provide input. If you yep. are an Oakland resident and you feel like something is missing, I just dropped the uh, link into the chat, uh, the, uh, this stage of the input uh, for the Oakland plan is open through the end of November. And um, the what will follow is a sort of a first draft, which will then have another opportunity for people to weigh in. Um, and many people have been suggesting tree related and ecosystem related um, uh, uh, points or, or programs in the development and community um, uh, and even in the mobility um, uh, action teams as well, since planting trees next to um, streets tends to provide a better uh, pedestrian experience and tends to slow traffic down on that street. And uh, it's come up a number of times, uh, as Rebecca, you were just showing the map uh, that was highlighting the Boulevard of the Allies, for instance, as being a uh, ripe opportunity for a tree line boulevard. So just throwing it out there. Cool. Uh, I think we can move to the next one. Um, so because I wasn't really working in, on the Oakland plan, uh, I thought I'd insert a couple other things that I am working on that's tree, tree related. Um, so Pittsburgh has a shade tree commission. Um, we meet monthly, uh, so it's the third Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. Um, we're open for public comment. Uh, we have a website uh, where you can find all the information, which I linked to there. Um, and then you can watch them all on the city's YouTube channel. Um, but we have a couple of exciting new programs that we're just launching um, that might be of interest. So uh, we've, we put out an RFP for a significant tree registry. Um, so Tree Pittsburgh is going to be um, developing a, a, 
a, a program um, where we'll be, uh, you know, identifying uh, significant trees within the city and then uh, working to, you know, protect them and um, uh, promote them. Um, so, you know, trees with uh, size, species, age, historical significance, ecological value, visibility, health, space, uh, exceptionality, collection, if there's a grove of them. Um, so these are all things that people are going to be able to like nominate. Uh, so for si significant trees across the city, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and then we're just launching an equitable street tree investment pro investment plan. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we, what we're trying to do is a shade tree commission and maybe I should give a little bit of background about the shade tree commission. Um, so they're all appointed by, uh, by the mayor um, for three year terms. Um, and it's uh, a good mix of uh, city employees. So employees from, from some of the departments and some of the authorities um, that have uh, work that, you know, is relative to, um, you know, either tree planting or sometimes uh, that come at loggerheads with trees, uh, pun intended. Um, but uh, yeah, and then the other, the other portion of um, the Shade Tree Commission is, um, you know, community members and um, nonprofit organizations, Duquesne Light. Um, so there's a lot of other organizations that are uh, NPN residents that are a part of the Shade Tree Commission. We get funding from uh, those Lamar advertising signs. Um, so we're able to, to put like the, um, the, the, what's the word? I'm sorry, I'm like missing words late at night. Um, but, you know, we have a, a contract with Lamar Advertising. They're like the big billboards, um, but that funding actually goes to the Shade Tree Commission, which is kind of cool. So it goes back into your, your tree canopy. Um, but so this year we're launching an equitable street tree investment plan, recognizing that there are a lot of under canopied uh, and disinvested in neighborhoods. Um, so basically every year we're, and this being the first year, we're choosing 10 neighborhoods um, across the city um, that, you know, really could use um, some, some extra, extra love on backlogged 311 calls, um, you know, increasing the tree canopy, a lot of uh, tree pits that are existing, but also empty. Um, so filling those tree pits, increasing community support and stewardship for trees, partnering with the community organization um, to promote the benefit of trees, um, things like that. So, uh, Oakland, unfortunately, is not in the first 10, but um, has been identified um, in, I, I think, you know, one of the, the future um, uh, neighborhoods. So I think we, we looked at like 30 different uh, communities and it, it made the top 30. So, um, you know, maybe one year, hopefully next year, uh, you know, the we might uh, blitz Oakland uh, with trees. Um, but yeah, you know, just leveraging as many city resources as we can uh, towards some target neighborhoods because, um, you know, 311 calls are, there's a ton of 311 calls, there's a ton of backlog 311 calls, there's limited staffing capacity. So, um, you know, trying to at least think about how we can group those things together to try to start to make some impact um, is, is the point there. Um, the investment plan also is looking at um, things like, you know, vacant city lots or, um, any other opportunities for green space where it might not exist. Um, and then the next slide is the last slide. Um, so we are just launching um, a super exciting new program. It's a Greenways partnership program. And I know there's the Oak Cliff uh, Greenway that you all have. Um, so Greenways are, just for a little bit of background, uh, there's 12, uh, 13, if you include Hayes Woods, uh, sites across the city, um, which comprise uh, 1,200 uh, acres. Um, mostly the Greenways have been uh, vacant lots. So in, in 1980, when the city lost uh, half of its population with the collapse of the steel industry, there was then a reverb effect where, you know, we lost half of the uh, city staffing population or the city staffing capacity. Um, so uh, simultaneously, the city came under the ownership of just a ton of vacant property. Um, so in 1980, city planning actually um, took those properties that were kind of contiguous um, and also located along steep hillsides that shouldn't then be um, you know, developed uh, in the future and, and put a permanent conservation easement on them and called them greenways. Um, but that also means that they left them up to uh, st resident stewardship uh, groups to maintain. Um, so there has not been any city um, 
resources or maintenance or anything that's gone into these greenways since 1980. So you can imagine, um, and I'm sure you know, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of dumping issues. Um, there's a ton of invasive vines. Um, they're just kind of in poor health. Um, but, you know, through a lot of our resilience work, because uh, I'm a resilience planner, um, we feel like uh, there's a huge asset, uh, potential asset here in the greenways, which are currently kind of a liability because we're experiencing a lot of landslides here. Um, so we launched a pilot program last year with some funding from the Trust for Public Land uh, in the Hazelwood Greenway, which is a 183 acre site in Hazelwood. Um, and basically we're trying, to, the point is to try to assemble as many different partners as we possibly can who can do all of the work. Um, and the city and the one PGH fund are trying to, um, you know, leverage uh, all of the city's resources. So uh, city forestry support, signage, benches, things like that, um, DPW cleanup pickups, things like that, um, and uh, work with the partners uh, to, to start to restore the sites and add some access. Um, so in this particular project, uh, we picked a two acre we ended up restoring a two acre plot of land. We worked with Hazelwood Initiative as the community-based organization. Um, so they led a ton of uh, get to know your greenway events. They had a snowshoeing event, which was really cool, um, but uh, cleanup events, other volunteer opportunities, tree plantings um, throughout the year. Um, city planning did uh, some visioning work. Uh, you know, how do people really want to um, use their, utilize their greenway, what's the vision for it, um, what are, you know, the, the corridors that are needed for, for good access to make people feel, feel safe, um, and like they could, you know, recreate in there, um, and then uh, we, through the One PGH Fund, um, which is a whole presentation in itself, uh, but we're able to fund uh, Land Force and some other partners to actually do the work. Uh, so the community organization didn't have to deal with contracts, um, you know, city contracts, anything like that. Um, but basically, uh, it went super well, went so well um, that we got another $430,000 grant recently from National Recreation and Parks Association to build this out into a full-blown program, uh, which is super cool. Um, we're going to get a greenways coordinator that's going to be hired at the one PGH fund to run it. Um, and the uh, program uh, uh, terms of the grant is, is a hard focus on equity, resilience and access. So um, we want to think really intentionally about, um, you know, uh, helping people use, uh, you know, make these good community assets that, um, you know, are accessible. Um, so a lot of the greenways don't even have signage. People don't know where to enter. Um, they don't feel safe there. Um, so a big focus on, on that and then also the resilience of the spaces. So, um, you know, starting to, to think about like, where do we need to target um, hillside, hillside issues or tree plantings, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so the partners in the Hazelwood project were um, Hazelwood Initiative, I mentioned, Land Force, uh, which is a really good workforce development organization that's focused on um, uh, land management. Um, they came in with a crew. They were able to hire a crew to come in. Um, they built a, an access trail. And then uh, with the help of some goats from Allegheny Goatscape, they kind of um, worked together to, to clear out the invasives. Um, and then Tree Pittsburgh came in last weekend and we planted 170 new trees in the restoration zone, which is super cool. Um, and then we've also been doing some work with um, Chatham University's Falk School um, about natural hillside stabilization methods. Um, so this is a super cool program. It's brand new. We're trying to maybe model it a little bit after Love Your Block, if you're familiar with Love Your Block. Um, but yeah, definitely targeted towards uh, the greenways. I know there's been a lot of interest in um, that Oak Cliff Greenway. Um, and I've been up there. It's super cool. I saw the blessed mother of the parkway um, last Christmas, but that's a super neat space. Um, but yeah, so just wanted to uh, say that this is kind of, this is on the horizon um, and we're really excited about it and a good opportunity for, for trees here too. Um, and I think that was my last uh, slide, but um, happy to take any questions or um, comments or thoughts. I think you are- Rebecca, that's really pretty awesome. Um, is anybody directing you? Anybody I, have any questions? 
I just have, um, I applaud your activities of planting trees in the green spaces, but I wonder if there is enough um, emphasis giving to maintaining the trees that we already have. I have like, um, I have one of the few remaining trees on my street and I put in a 311 in March and they came out and said, oh yeah, this tree really needs to be pruned up, but nobody's pruned it yet. Mm. So I'm wondering if, if your program involves an emphasis on maintaining what we already have. Um, you know, we lost a huge tree in this block to the last storm, probably because it had never been pruned up so the wind couldn't blow through it. Yeah, that's, that's such a good question. Um, but maintenance has been a really, uh, really source, but really hard to do. We have very small forestry division um, for the amount of tree canopy that we have. Um, so that's been a, a really big challenge. Um, we've been doing a lot of advocating for this infrastructure bill to, inc to include trees in it. Um, there's also the, the parks tax, uh, which should alleviate some of the um, forestry needs like within the parks um, and free, free up our forestry division for, um, you know, more street tree maintenance. Um, but yeah, it's a huge challenge um, in the equitable. So we have talked, we've talked a ton about maintenance. Um, but in both of those programs that I mentioned, the Equitable Street Tree Investment Program, and then also in the Greenways, we're thinking about like uh, different models for community stewardship or being able to potentially pay stewards, but definitely some sort of training program uh, to, you know, kind of deputize uh, local, um, you know, residents to be able to, to care for and, and, you know, help us maintain the trees as well. I'd just like to say that that is how the Tree Vitalize program currently functions or what its purpose was in the first place was to sort of deputize people who live next to trees as their primary caretakers or people who can at least alert the city as to, you know, issues that need to be taken care of before they become uh, life-threatening to the tree. Um, and the issue that we have in Oakland, uh, for the most part, as you can imagine, Kathy, is that unlike in other neighborhoods where you could have like large numbers of people who are like long-term residents within close proximity to uh, street trees who, you know, can be trained as tree tenders and can bear an active part in taking care of the trees. Um, the young and energetic people that we have in Oakland for the most part have very short tenures here. And um, so it's not as feasible uh, to depend on individuals to actually provide that kind of maintenance. So OPDC is partnering with the Pit Serves Green Team to incorporate tree tender training into the Green Team's uh, annual training um, uh, program uh, in an effort to make sure that there is always a ready supply of trained tree tenders available and interested and ready to be deployed for uh, Oakland street care, street, street, street care. But you know, old trees like what you're talking about, uh, Kathy, uh, uh, is those are those are much harder since it's beyond the capacity of you know like you know random kid with some pruning shears to climb a mature tree and to be able to um, you know uh, do battle with upper branches and so forth. And that's obviously a task for professionals and um, people who are able to get up that high uh, to deal with the upper branches. So um, just what Rebecca said. Um, I, I have had, we've, we've gone substantially over our time and I wish that we had more time to really get into the trees and perhaps we can revisit this at a future date. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody who's participated uh, and to let everyone know that we do actually have the fall street uh, tree planting in Oakland. Uh, we are, I believe 19 trees are being planted on Saturday. Um, the uh, group is congregating on Parkview Avenue, north of the boulevard. Uh, I know this because I'm feeding everybody breakfast. Um, and if you have any interest in participating, please let us know. If you have an interest, if you have a street tree uh, opportunity that you'd like to uh, make sure gets included in next year's planting, uh, please send us a note to uh, questions at opdc.org and we will make sure to circle back to you and to let, uh, to see what we can do about including that on next year's roster. Um, and I had, sorry, <laughs> Geraldine is searching through the thing for all of the different, 
where we are. And this is the final announcement is that we have two uh, upcoming de development activities meetings coming up. Um, one of them, as I had mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, uh, is on Monday the 29th, the Monday after Thanksgiving at six o'clock via Zoom uh, to discuss the proposed Oakland Public Realm Subdistrict E, um, which is the zoning bill 2021-1906 uh, that um, uh, Walnut Capital is um, hoping uh, will pass. Uh, so this is the, the opportunity for the public to come and ask questions about the bill and to provide um, uh, feedback about it and uh, its content and its process, uh, all of which will then be delivered uh, to the Planning Commission um, uh, for their hearing in January. Um, the next one is on the very next day, Tuesday the 30th at six o'clock, uh, an update on the Presbyterian bed tower. Um, and also there is another property actually on that agenda, uh, which is the uh, old Paul Younger building on the corner of uh, Ward and the Boulevard. I can't remember its address just yet, sorry, uh, but there is just a, uh, uh, a design proposal for, from the current owner uh, to redevelop that site uh, as um, a residential property. So uh, please tune in to learn more about that and let me know if you have any questions. And thank you very much for your patience and uh, your participation. And we really appreciate you. And I hope you have a great evening. <laughs>